Behold, the golden age of television streaming is upon us and past the popcorn. Whether you're in search of that new series to binge watch or seek out the documentary that will change the conversation on the hot topic of the day, the bidding war between entertainment industry giants has we viewers glued to our screens and at prices that can't be beat. But beware, happy television viewers, the joy won't last forever. That $650 billion binge, as The Economist called it in a recent cover story, is a race for market share. And when the dust settles, expect plenty of analogies to Game of Thrones. In the meantime, how does streaming change the way we tell stories? The golden age of Hollywood didn't factor in vast swathes of the planet because, well, vast swathes of the planet didn't yet have movie houses. What happens when your potential audience is, well, the whole world? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the golden age of the TV series. With us, Alex Berger, producer of the award-winning French TV series The Bureau and the author of a report for the French National Film Board, the CNC, uh, with recommendations for French uh, scripted uh, television fiction. Absolutely. Uh Bonjour, welcome, hello to thanks all. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. I want to thank, uh, uh, welcome as well. He writes for uh, the likes of Variety and IndieWire film and TV critic, Ben Kroll. Hello, nice to, nice to be here. Nice, nice, nice to welcome you. A reporter, Capucine Cousin, the author of, in French, Netflix and co, behind the scenes of a revolution. Hello. Welcome. Thanks. And uh, France 24's Deep Ticolorant reviews all matters of small screen Truth and fiction for Encore, <laughs> France 24's culture show. How are you? That's fine. The France 24 debate throughout the year on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag F24 debate. Oh, how times have changed. It's been 20 years since the first episode of The Sopranos. At the time, it was a pay channel HBO that broke ground with series like Sex in the City, Six Feet Under, The Wire. That seems like so long ago, Ben Kroll. It was a long time ago, and at the same time, not that long, if you really consider the lifetime of the medium and everything, uh, all things considered. Uh, you know, in 1999, 1998, a lot of the focus of the sort of prestige uh, cultural production was with film. You know, film was the most uh, prestigious way to get your voice heard and to... Uh, you know, accrue some sort of cultural capital as an artist. Uh, that's changed now, and that really was linked with the advent of prestige television with The Sopranos that kind of marks the seismic shift uh, in where uh, actors, filmmakers, screenwriters could really pursue their craft at a high level. And when did when did the sort of the streaming revolution begin in earnest for you? Uh, well, the streaming revolution began in earnest about, probably about 10 years ago, but the streaming revolution really changed and which had a huge seismic effect on the entire international industry is it caused the home video market to collapse. You know, people were making a lot of money uh, by DVD sales, video rentals, and that's what sort of pushed the industry forward. And that's what allowed a lot of independent films to find success. Uh, when the home video industry collapsed, the focus moved to streaming, which put a, a more... Well, basically, streaming makes it easier to have series. And so when the home video market sort of didn't find the same success that it once had, people moved to streaming, and the focus moved from film production to television production, in a way. Moved from to film production to television production, and it's like it's all gone into hyperdrive. Yes, uh, that's something quite new, because uh, Netflix has launched as a streaming uh, service 12 years ago, uh, and House of Cards has launched in uh, 2013. So it, it was really something new because uh, House of Cards, it was uh, realized by uh, David Lynch. It was really a uh, very good quality series. Uh, it was quite new uh, on TV. It was big quality. It was more or less the same quality as a, as a movie. It was the uh, first time that we could see that. First time we could see that. Fast forward to 2019, Diptyque Laurent, and you have at the Emmy Awards the best outstanding comedy uh, going to a Netflix series. Or not a Netflix uh, no, series, excuse me. No, it was an Amazon Prime Amazon series. Amazon Prime series, the competition, mm. yes. That's right. And not just that, Francois, it was a British comedy, a very mm. quintessential uh, British comedy that appeared on BBC and then Amazon 
uh, bought the rights to it, and that's how everybody started talking about it. And uh, that's how its journey from British comedy uh, and on the BBC all the way to the Emmys, and not just... We're talking about Fleabag. Fleabag, that's right. And not just outstanding comedy, it had dethroned a darling of the Emmys, which was uh, Veep, which is a very American political satire that dominated that category for some years in the past. And suddenly you have this uh, British comedy that comes in that changes the whole game. It was very, uh, very um, incredible. And kudos to Phoebe Waller-Bridge because uh, she was really the brains behind that. And she's a person, if there's one person who slayed 2019, it's, it's her. She's just dominated everything she's done. Well, that's in a way, if we can just build on that, you know, Veep was an HBO show. I think it's kind of reached its conclusion now. Yeah. Veep was an HBO show led by a major star uh, that initially started with one big showrunner that then changed to another showrunner. The original showrunner, I think, was Armando Iannucci, who had mm. also a large, you know, very popular career on British television. Then it became Dave Mandel, who had, of course, uh, worked on Seinfeld for a long time. And so there was this huge tradition of the American industry mm. in Veep. You know, Veep was something that was a product of what we were saying before, this 1999 moment where the focus moved to prestige cable. And now we see something 20 years later where it moves from it's prestige going global. cable to something that's completely global. It's exactly. global, it's British, it's not even American. Well, France it's even more than that. I mean, I think it is the triumph of the writer. It's the triumph of the the author. I mean, um, what all these examples are about these showrunners. What is a showrunner? A showrunner is the creator, is the the head writer. I mean, is the the creative uh, 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 force behind all of these shows. Is a TV and, series all about the writing? Yes. For me, there are two real uh, components. One is the writing, and the other one is the writing. No, uh, seriously, <laughs> it's the writing and the the cast. I mean, the way that that writing is being interpreted. And then there is, of course, you know, the, the director. And, and, and the director is the choreographer of the writing, as far as we're concerned. And that doesn't... It just changes the field a little bit. It was, and especially in France, since um, the the Nouvelle Vague, where the 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 réalisateur was central to everything, and even in in scripted drama on TV, everything was about the second rewrite of a show by the director. And here, uh, what what we've been doing at the Bureau des Légendes, at the bureau, has been centered around the showrunner, Eric Rochon. The creator of the show had a pool of writers, what has been going on in the United States for the past 60 years, in a very precise organization. And that was the whole concept. And that, I think, is the big paradigm shift that's going on today, notably with the streamers, which is we're making these writers more uh, powerful. And that is a very good thing for the quality of the shows. Yeah, let's talk about The Bureau because it is, uh, there are other breakout French series like Call My Agent, but The Bureau yeah, is, 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 is quite unique because it's got these well-crafted plot lines, a lot of suspense, and these big name actors like Mathieu Kazovitz, like Bond villain uh, Mathieu Almaric, uh, who, who, are, who are in them. Is it unique in the French market in that sense? Mathieu Kazovitz. Um, well, I think what's unique about the Bureau is a couple of things. One, as you said, we were able to attract amazing writers, and Eric comes from a cinematographic world. I mean, he did movies before and had done Mafiosa for Canal Plus. But our obsession was how can we be as ambitious, as exigent as the American shows or the British shows have been in the past decades. And what we did is we... So you can compete with <coughs> the equivalent of Hollywood when it comes to TV series. Well, you have to import a method. You have to... If you don't have the same system, you can't compete. Mm. Uh, the system in France was roughly six shows every 24 to 36 months. Now, in a non-competitive world, that's fine. But in an ultimate and very crowded atmosphere, you can't sustain a brand or a show or have the audience have an engagement, an emotional engagement, if you're just every two or three years. So what we did is we analyzed what was going on in the U.S. We went and we broke a show. We developed a show with some U.S. showrunners, and Eric saw the light. Eric Rochon saw the light. He had his 
ideas in his head, but he saw how the method worked. And what we did <laughs> is we imported two things. We adapted two things. One, the, the writer's room at, within the SACD, within the droit d'auteur, as it is a in Copyright French. institution. Yes. And then we did the same thing for labor law because we have to do a show. It shows roughly 12 days. Mm. In the U.S., it's nine. So we had to adapt Cap all this. So, Cap Yeah, Capucine Cousin, let me ask you, because uh, some say, yeah, there's a lot of good French series, but um, the German ones, the, the the Nordic ones are better. That's what I've heard uh, as, as a criticism. What, what is your view? No, you have also good French <laughs> series, of course. You have I'm French series on, on Canal+, Plus, which can go worldwide, but you have also over French series, uh, for for instance, you have a French series, a uh, French series which is called Ten Percent, Dix Percent. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, which was available on Netflix and it was very uh, a big success. It is uh, on the behind the scenes of uh, the economy of uh, TV and so on. So, yeah. so let me ask you then, Titi, mm. um, if you look at 2019 and you did, yes, um, <laughs> you what you found was the the flea bag mm -hmm. uh, was part of a trend, which is to cater to a global audience and not just to men. That's right. In fact, it was really, for me, 2019 was about women. There were yeah. so many women, so many good quality women driven shows. You had Fleabag, of course, and we know that it won all those awards, but you have, um, for instance, um, Big Little Lies. That was an HBO show that came out with three, uh, four major leads, uh, all well-known actresses who were part of the second season. You had um, The Morning Show that came out um, just, uh, just a, a month ago with Jennifer Aniston, who is, as we were saying, a, a 90s icon. You can get get more of a 90s TV icon than Jennifer Aniston and it's the first time we're seeing her in a serious it's role and okay whatever you think about the show I, I thought she was really good she played this and it was so relevant she was this harried middle-aged presenter trying to hold the, the ship the together fortune, while yeah. what, you know in this post me too movement in a newsroom it was it was um, really good but then you know what you also had some really um, indie shows as well there was um on netflix a show called um tuka and birdie that came out uh, an animated show about bird women uh it's an adult comedy um and they talk about things like oh uh, sexual harassment you know my boss he grabbed my behind is that sexual you know they talk about these current topics but in an animated form and then there was a show that i really 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 loved this year which was um again on hbo um mrs fletcher i don't know if any of you have oh. seen that show um, this was, it was fantastic because it was, again, a show about the Me Too movement, but it was a woman whose son goes to college and she's kind of an empty nester and she doesn't know what to do. So she accidentally discovers, rediscovers her sexuality. Um, and at the same time, her son, who's kind of this jock, is discovering the limits to his sexuality in college um, and in this post Me Too movement. And it was so clever and it was such a good way to... to to tackle such yeah. a marvelous Miss Maisel is is one of these that has come out that has been very iconic because they that show sort of on Amazon Prime sort of starting to dethrone some of the HBO uh, gloss at, at, at one point there but there's so many amazing writers that that that, that are that are going around and do great shows if there's one show for 2019 that sort of says 2019 to you ben Kroll, what would it be i know this is a bit of a cliche but it does have to be game of thrones just because it was an international oh. phenomenon mm -hmm. yeah. that was seen by more people in 2019 than any other piece of audiovisual content. At the same time, it's really interesting if you think about it, because if 2019's, if, if, if the biggest audiovisual piece of content of 2019 was Game of Thrones, does that mean that Kit Harington and uh, uh, Emilia Clark and um, Peter Dinklage are the biggest stars in the world? Not quite. <laughs> and so that does speak to something very interesting about television as well, is that you can have a large international phenomenon that doesn't still have the same cultural import um, as other mediums do. And so that's a future that, that points out a future for television while you can still be a, a cultural blockbuster, a cultural phenomenon, but there's still room to advance in terms of the cultural discourse. Do you think that Casa de Papel was part of those, I mean, on the European side? Because we've been I think Casa de Papel the, is one of the, the most important shows that's happening yeah. in Europe yeah, right now. Yeah. Um, Nordic Noir has been, 
you know, well, uh, for so long uh, they had, but all of a sudden comes this amazing phenomenon that is Spain. worldwide. Uh, it's yeah, it's worldwide. Spain. It's huge. And that actually points out something even more fascinating is the fact that Casa de Papel is filmed in Spanish. Right. You know, Netflix's model, and we talk, you, many of the shows that you brought up before were from Netflix. Many mm. of the, of course, you've written a whole book about that. That's mm. fantastic. Um, Netflix's model is it doesn't want to compete with other people in the marketplace. It wants to become the marketplace. Right. Um, so the, mo the Netflix model isn't saying, okay, we have all of these shows that we want you to watch. It's we have all of these shows that you know you're not going to be able to watch. Exactly. And we're going to inundate you with content. <laughs> and we're going to make you feel bad. I've known, I know that I myself have said it. I've had people say it to me. They apologize when they say, oh, I'm so sorry. I haven't had the time to watch this show yet. <laughs> that is the Netflix model. It's the FOMO model. It's the yeah. fear of missing out model. <laughs> That's true. And and, and that's are you relevant around the water cooler on the, uh, yeah. that morning? Uh, I haven't seen it. I'm not yeah. part of the exactly. I'm not part of the discussion. And that's what's going to get you to keep on paying those subscription fees. Yeah. Café Saint Cousin, is there one show for you? Says 2019. Um, as a French uh, journalist, I would say uh, the French the first uh, series which was uh, remarkable in France. It was during the 90s. It was emergency room because uh, urgence in French because it was uh, shown in uh, France 2 the Sunday evening it was uh, the first time that we had a series which was uh, shown on the Sunday evening and I'm, it was I'm the big public broadcaster and for yeah. today what about the what is there a new series that you for you stands uh, it's on Canal Plus it's uh, years and years uh, because of this series is about the post-Brexit UK, so it could be true tomorrow or in two years. I think it's really, uh, it's frightening, but it's quite realistic. Yeah, one of the questions we've been wondering is, uh, will the UK uh, opt for more of a American way of doing business when it comes to entertainment or more of a European way? We'll talk about it when we come back. Stay with us, you're watching a special year-end edition of the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us for a holiday edition of the uh, France 24 debate. As we look at 2019 and ahead to 2020, we're looking at uh, what is the golden age of the TV series that is upon us. We're talking about it with Alex Berger, producer of the award-winning French uh, TV spy series, The Bureau. We're also in the company. We welcome back uh, uh, Variety and IndieWire film and TV critic Ben Kroll. Uh, Capucine Cousin, the author of Netflix and Co. Behind the Scenes of a Revolution. You put the R in, in little parenthesis. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit if you want. Because it's an evolution and a revolution. At the same time. Okay, yeah. you're opting for both there. Diptyque Laurent, France 24, who, uh, who uh, reviews all matters uh, from the small screen uh, for us. Yes, yeah, studios and streaming services falling over themselves, we were talking about it in part one, to outbid the competition for the latest hot uh, script. And you can see uh, this is just for the United States, the numbers, but I imagine globally it's... Uh, it, 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 it's it's also the case, uh, as as Alex Berger was mentioning in part one, it's, it's the age of the writer as well, the age of the TV series. But this be told, Diptika, it's not just fiction. No, um, in fact, um, the daily news cycle has become somewhat of a television producer's dream now. Things You can see shows being, um, uh, sh the rights to shows being sold as the story is taking place in the news. And um, this year was really about, for me at least, three major uh, documentaries. There was uh, HBO's excellent and gripping miniseries, Chernobyl, um, that kind of made us all experts in nuclear disaster. It was so well explained um, and probably also left the Russians wondering why they hadn't done it sooner. Uh, but let's take a look, uh, just at a clip of uh, Chernobyl. All of the good we did, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that to them, justice was done. See, a just world is a sane world. There was nothing sane about Chernobyl. I'm pleased to report that the situation in Chernobyl is stable. In terms of radiation, 
I'm told it's the equivalent of a chest X-ray. The showrunner. Yeah, I mean, the Ch Chernobyl um, was just one of um, many documentaries. There was uh, also Unbelievable about a teenager who reports, it's also a true story, a teenager who reports a rape, then recants his story, and the impact uh, of uh, of that it was very made for very difficult viewing and um, a lot of the actual events were shown in flashback but you it's done in such a way that you still get a sense of the fear that she felt and and you know there are questions around whether that happened or not um, there was also the very controversial when they see us on Netflix it was about the Central Park five who were exon um, well initially um, convicted and then exonerated of the rape of a jogger in 1989 now let's show you just a little clip of when they see us which won an um, any Emmy award actually this year is my mom here? It's just us. You and us. Who you in the park with? I don't know names. I just got lost. Where did you see the lady? One, one lady. The female jogger was severely beaten and raped. Every black male who was in the park last night is a suspect. I need all of them. What's going on with my son? Your son was involved in a rape in Central Park. What? No, no, it's, no, wait a minute. Wait a second, wait a second. They saw you rape the lady. I didn't see a lady or hit anyone. And there was also one more uh, that was um, uh, Netflix tapping into French criminal history, a very French cold case, which was the case of Grégory Villemin, the little four-year-old boy uh, who was uh, killed in 1984. They made a documentary out of that. or so It's sort of a documentary. It uses real images from the time. It interviews people who were involved in the case um, and sort of made us all investigators in the murder of uh, this little boy. And, and you have people beyond France who are suddenly talking about this very French criminal case. So that was pretty interesting. Yeah, the, mm. the, the, yeah. the case of Le Petit Grégory, as it's yes. known, the little, little Grégory. Everybody in France knows about it. Nobody outside of France knows about it. And now that's changing, Capucine Cousin. Yeah, because it's a cold case of the uh, 80s. Uh, yeah. And it was a very uh, big uh, case. And it is uh, strange to see today some uh, testimonies which come back of uh, an old affair. But uh, there's also an, uh, another documentary of uh, Netflix about a French case, uh, 13 November Fluctuat Nekimar Gitur. It was a documentary in uh, four uh, times about uh, the attempts of Paris of uh, four years ago. And uh, it was very interesting because this documentary could have been seen on uh, Arte or in uh, French TV in France. Right. And I think there's something, there's a trend here, and I think, Ben, you wanted to talk about this, is that there's so much information that we have access to, and the spectators that are watching TV or, or watching these shows want a sense of reality. They want to learn, and whatever, even if it is totally scripted drama like the Bureau, everything has to be extremely precise. And you were talking about all of these shows. They're all very precisely researched. They're all very precisely written. That is something that if you don't have credibility, your show can sort of just crumble. Ben Curls, you heard Deep T's uh, selection there. Some of it is documentary and some of it is docu-fiction. Docu-fiction. And, and it I, talks to what Alex was just saying. And it's interesting to see the the realm of people that are making these shows. I mean, talking about Chernobyl, mm -hmm. the showrunner of Chernobyl was a man named Craig Mazin. He's uh, from the film world, but he's a comedian. I mean, he's, yeah. he, he's a, a script writer who writes comedy scripts. I believe he wrote one of the scary movies. He, write, he writes farces. And the fact that the overwhelming possibilities of the current television landscape allow someone who had been pigeonholed into one specific subgenre yeah. of the film world to go make probably the most celebrated docudrama television show of the year. Now, is that something that could have been done for the big screen or is it because of... Oh, I think that it's, it's definitely... It's because of the medium. It's because of streaming. I think it's definitely medium specific. I think that you can certainly try to uh, accomplish these stories on the big screen, but the time that you're afforded with television, you can really open the story up, you can investigate different pockets, you can investigate different avenues that really rewards uh, time, investment, and uh, interest on the viewer's part. But Same thing with true. when they the see The Irishman us. Is, this, is a very important illustration. Three hours and 40 minutes, I think, to watch a movie. And I think that's what is extremely important, which is that engagement with the time. How long am I going to have to engage myself with the story, with the characters, etc. 
And the streaming platforms and this recurrency of, of the shows enables us to find that, that warmth. I want to come back and see what I'm used to seeing and, and, and those characters, etc. And that's very fundamental for so what's you, going you, on. Do you watch The Irishman in one sitting? Of or course you, I did. Yeah. Of and course. I think it was three hours and 40 minutes did, I had did to you? lose. I did, I did. But I think <laughs> viewers respond to that is they want to know that they're in good hands. Yeah. Right. There's so much content out there. There's so much to but watch, I'm so much to do. They want to feel that I'm in good hands. I'm being treated. My intelligence is being treated well. Benton Kroll, I'm haunted by what you said in part one about people feel guilty for not watching the show. <laughs> right. Last year, it was Afonso Cuaron's Roma. Because it's, now it's not just TV series. It's, as we're talking about it, movies as well. Right, Full-length right. feature movies. Last year was Afonso Cuaron's Roma, which nearly took home Best Picture at the Oscars. Now, if you want to, again, see through all three hours and 30 minutes of Martin Scorsese's Opus, The Irishman, uh, and well, you should. It's fantastic. It's great. It's great. <laughs> you have Frankly. to once again turn to Netflix. This project was a long time in the ma making. Uh, Monty Scorsese and Robert De Niro were trying to get this film made for many years. It was a love child of theirs. And Netflix came along to make that possible. Of course, Capucine Cousin, uh, French theater owners are not going to be happy listening to No, her. because of the chronology des médias in France. Because you can't show a film on TV uh, 17 months because uh, before, uh, after the... It has to a incite on. people to go to the movies, there, yeah. there are rules in France. Yeah, it's uh, very strict. Because uh, The Irishman, it was shown on a little bit of... Uh, in a in few... Theaters. Theaters in uh, the US. It wasn't possible in France. You have had only one uh, projection in uh, La Cinémathèque, but it was just a special event. You can't show it on our uh, theaters. It's a big uh, debate uh, since uh, three, four years in France. It has created a debate in uh, the Festival de Cannes uh, this year, last year. So, is it, so what do you think? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? You heard Harvey Keitel's argument. I think we that, wouldn't have um, had the money otherwise. Personally, I think that a film like The Irishman could be... Uh, should be uh, available for everyone. Now you have to be uh, on Netflix uh, to see it. It's uh, well, it's quite new and it's quite uh, strange. Uh, Alex, oh, Belgium, well, you, you, I, I Alex think, Belgium, you know, you've I, just I, written I, that report for the for the National Film Board, the CNC. Yeah, yeah. I, I well, th this uh, you know the trend that's going on uh, in New York. Uh, Netflix just bought the Paris Theater. Um, I think they did one in, in L.A. They tried to buy the Egyptian theater, but right. that hasn't gone through yet, but they did buy a historic uh, New York So I theater. think that, you know, as disruptive as Netflix and the other platforms have been, I think they're going to continue to be disruptive. I think that if they want and if you want to see The Irishman or whatever is going to come up in a movie theater, I think it should be possible. So you who's whispering into the ear of the French government right now on these matters, what would you? What advice do you give them? Well, I well, first of all, my my biggest shout it's not a whisper my biggest shout is we need to you, we need to regulate a little bit because it's the far west first of all do you know besides china which country is the most regulated in the world the united states of america to be able to produce a show you have to be part of the guild or one of the guilds if you if, and not you have to obey the rules of the major studios. So what is happening today and what my report is really saying is it's a clash of two systems. One system that is very organically, it's been there around for 75 years from the studios, the major studios, and then the French system, which is very uh, much more, that, that the US, US system is vertical, the French system is more horizontal. We need to impose what has happened and the vote happened this year, le droit d'auteur, the rights of the author. So I think what is going and to... can Europe do it? Oh, yeah. Well, they started voting Article 13 and Article 11, and that's going to go ahead. And I think that what's going to be happening in the future, and um, three of, uh, of the, the ministers that were really uh, uh, in charge of all this have already stepped up to bat, you want to do commerce in France, you're going to have to obey some rules. You're going to have to pay taxes. You're going to have to pay into the CNC. You can't just take the talent and take people's money and not give back. 
So that is going to be a fundamental, I think, economically. But moreover, what we need to do is have a process that is extremely visible, lisible, understandable by everybody, transparent, mm. and how it works. And I think that is what the reform de l'audiovisuel is going to be about. The broadcasting reform. The broadcasting reform. I think the, these new laws are going to happen. And even if the commercial wars are more or less already won by these platforms, I mean, the, the, just the size and the investments that they're making every year locally and globally is something huge. I think that what's going to happen in the near future is they're going to adapt to be able to make local locomotives, have great shows and movies done everywhere in the world, and they have to play by the rules. Capucine country. Cousin, after writing your book, do you get the sense that the Europe can regulate, can impose its law on the big uh, U.S. entertainment giants? Uh, you have uh, big laws uh, which have uh, which are being uh, adopted in Europe uh, against. Uh, or for instance, you have a project of law for, of taxes for the gaffers. Uh, you have something like that. You have uh, laws uh, to force uh, streamers to to pay taxes in Europe. So it's a uh, it's only the beginning. Of, je, je sais pas quoi dire. It's so it's just the beginning. You're saying yeah. well, it's yeah, too early to tell. Too early to tell. Uh, Netflix and Amazon uh, may be the new kids on the block. But by the way, don't count out the likes of a 96 year old company called Disney. The fight <laughs> isn't just between Europe and the United States. Yeah, Disney, after buying Fox earlier this year, has now launched its own streaming service. Shirley Sitbon takes a look. They're Disney's secret weapons to tap into the highly competitive streaming sector. Hit movies and characters, Star Wars and Marvel superheroes, Disney's ESPN sports stations, and National Geographic. Since the Disney Plus service is somewhat short on new content, the company has pulled out its catalog of classics. It's also offering a subscription price lower than its rivals at $7 per month like a Netflix but for Disney from what I understand and um, I heard they're going to do a frozen making of documentary so I'm excited for that. The target for the new service 90 million new customers by 2024. It begins operations in the US, Canada and the Netherlands before Australia and New Zealand. It will then gradually expand to other world regions only reaching all of Europe by 2021. Obviously, there'll be a lot of players out there, but I think for us, having that depth of that library and the storytelling talent that sits within the studio is really going to be what sets us apart. The top player in the field remains Netflix, with its 158 million subscribers, followed by Amazon, Apple and Hulu, while other operators are set to start their own streaming services. Each one is trying to expand its catalog, investing in new original content. Apple has so far invested about a billion euros in new productions. Next to Netflix, 11 billion euros invested this year. 11 billion. Seems like the numbers are just so big. The race is definitely on. It means bidding wars for, as we've been mentioning, it's series, documentaries, sports rights, including the premiership uh, over this holiday period. Uh, ben Kroll, you look at this chart. It's impressive, isn't it? <laughs> What's yeah. it going to look like, though, in three, four years? I mean, it's an arms race right now, and it, it, it cannot last in the way that the situation is right now thing is, these major companies have so much resources to invest and that they're spending all of it right now to try to get some kind of market share. Some do they have of the, the resources share. or are they borrowing to do this? Where are they getting this well, money? AT&T Warner has spent $30 billion dollars on content, but that's what it's all about. Right. The Apple value is, is not only on the company uh, yeah. and they're investing as much money as they possibly can. Amazon is probably the biggest company in the world, but, and their big project going forward is they're remaking the entire Lord of the Rings. <laughs> for $200 million. Yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, when, I'll do it for $100 million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give me the money. When Netflix, when Disney enters the game, is it game over for Netflix at some point down there? Uh, what is interesting, I think, is that uh, Disney, Amazon, Apple, uh, they have a big market cap, whereas Netflix is quite uh, fragile. Uh, it's a business model. It's uh, to have more and more depth. They have at least 
10 billion dollars of debt today. We don't know the exact figure. So it's quite uh, fragile. Um, so their future you know, is so I mean, I mean that uh, Disney, Apple, Amazon, they have a lot of cash that they can spend. Whereas uh, Netflix, they don't have so much cash. They, they have to borrow more and more new debts to... Well, one thing that Netflix has that you know Disney doesn't is that ne Disney has a very firm brand identity. Yeah. And yeah. so whatever is going to come out on Disney Plus has to adhere to that brand identity. Whereas Netflix is amorphous. Netflix is one thing for kids. One, you know, Netflix is competing against food television for some people, children's television for other people, uh, prestige films, and action comedies. It could be everything for. So old is that people. good or bad? It's good for creators. I mean, it's, it's 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 great for creators, but it's also pretty limiting. I mean, when Apple goes out and says, "Well, wait, I can't." Go or Disney, I can't go too radical in the subject matters. I can't be totally open because that might hurt my brand, or it might hurt the sales of iBooks uh, or iPads or what or iPhones. That is something very interesting. So there is an auto regulation also on the subject matter, especially for Disney and Apple, because they're afraid because they have other businesses and 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 they're all tied into how the public will react. So I think that. Of course, it's great, and it's great. This is the best time to be a producer ever, ever, because it's just the, the so, amount of stuff that is required for this but you global to, audience. But you need to feed the beast. You feed the beast, but at the same time, you know, it's ideas are all over the place. It's, it's the, the amazing talent of people that know how to write, direct, act, the technicians around there are great, but I mean, this is an opportunity, that once in a lifetime opportunity. And this, it's interesting what you were saying <coughs> before, Alex. You said um, the French market is vertical. It's, it's, it's very horizontal. horizontal. The US yeah. market is vertical. Yeah. I would say the Indian market is parallel. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Um, because there is some, something incredible that's happening in the Indian market. Like, uh, just uh, to give you a figure, a, a Netflix earnings report said that. 7.9 million of the 9.1 million new Netflix sub subscribers this year came from international markets. Right. Uh, there are predictions that the Asia-Pacific market will earn more, the streaming market will earn more than the U.S. as early as 2021. And it's hard to do business with China, but it's maybe easier with India because, for instance, uh, a lot of the Indian shows that are coming out on Netflix are in English to appeal to a broader audience. Uh, not just, I mean, there was a show um, on Amazon Prime called Made in Heaven, and, and yes. I'd, I'd seen the whole show, and it was... It was um, it was absolutely astounding, the show. It was a show about wedding planners who plan these huge weddings in India for big families. And each episode is a wedding, but each episode deals with things like you have a runaway bride or you have a, a, a bride who's secretly gay or you have a sexual abuse or you have all these subtle issues that are being treated. And it was In a nation that's socially conservative. Exactly. In a nation where Bollywood, a Bollywood movie of that kind of content can see uh, cinemas being boycotted and protests in the street. It's very interesting. Interesting what you're saying because technology is making all of this possible. And, and this is really a paradigm shift, which is the phone. You can watch, I mean, especially in, uh, in India where the telephone, everybody has a cell phone. And not everybody has another link. I mean, the, there's no cable or, or satellites hard. Mm. Here, everybody, and that ubiquity is absolutely fabulous because those why, that's why the numbers are just so gigantic in all of these countries. And, and just around China, what I've been seeing in emerging countries like Myanmar and, 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 and Vietnam is that all of a sudden, wherever you are, you can get that cell uh, and you can watch on that app, or that Netflix or that or whatever other app, uh, Amazon app, you can watch your shows. That in itself is making a lot. It's changing the marketplace. Also, it's changing politics, too. It's changing politics. It's changing regulations, it's changing that. So this and is it's also changing the way we write, because you have to understand we used to write for a cliffhanger that was that Monday or Friday night, and you'd show one show, the HBO model, and then you'd have to keep everybody glued for a week until you came back. Now, it's streaming, and it's binge-watching, and you can literally sit down and watch as many episodes as you can possibly do. Well, yeah. And then, how do you write for that? Well, you have to write 
those cliffs and that dynamic in a very interesting and subtle way, which changes the way we, we, we write and produce. Well, if they say, as they say, if the medium is the message, then, you know, previously television, you were just competing against what else was on television. Right. If you're watching something on a phone, you're also competing against Tetris. <laughs> you're also, you're also, true, so, yeah. you're also competing against YouTube tutorial videos. Right, exactly. And so that's what the, one of the reasons why you're seeing this consolidation um, of these major international players because Netflix, it doesn't matter for Netflix if they have a film, if they right. have a series, if they have a tutorial, if they have a 17-minute music video, which they did with a recent Paul Thomas Anderson uh, exactly. anima. Uh, it doesn't matter. All that matters is, is that you are logged on to the Netflix app and you are using the Netflix app and they are completely collapsing any distinction between content based on time, space, or... Uh, well, that's Apple's formal. model. They have now the podcast, the games... Of course, the books and and the videos, and it's all separated out, but under one umbrella brand. Exactly. And all of this is very, very interesting. It's very interesting for creators like us, which is how do we compete with mm. all these eyeballs? And the millennials can do at least two or three of these things while they're watching. So it's also how sticky we can make these programs, how relevant, as you were pointing out, of all these programs that are real, mm -hmm. that are credible, or at least plausible, or total fantasy, if we go that way. I mean, The Mandalorian is very mm -hmm. interesting to see because it's it, more of the same, but it's a twist, and it's a smart little way of doing something different in the same world. Well, is The Mandalorian, just to, one thing... Very is, quick, because we're out of time. Okay, is The Mandalorian not in some way dissimilar to another major box office sensation of the year, The Joker, right. which is that it's a Star Wars tale, but it's also a Western, exactly. whereas The Joker was a Batman movie, but it's also a Martin Scorsese it, movie. Exactly, yeah. exactly, so exactly. you're right, you're right. It's the brand identity above and all. And that's the creative push that's going on right now it's like right, so oh, tw how are we going to take those brands that were for some of them very stale and create and, and recreate and re them. them yeah 2020 should have plenty of surprises alex Berger, i want to thank i want to thank as well thank Pat you Lucina, very much Cousin, thank you for I want to thank deep tiki laurent as well as ben kroll thank you for joining us here for this special year-end edition of the france 24 debate